In fact, something of a watershed appears to have been reached in the year 2003. In that year, three scientists, Arvind Bord, Alexander Vilenkin, and Alan Guth, were able to prove that any universe which is on average expanding throughout its history cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. And what makes their proof so powerful is that it holds independently of any physical description of the early universe. Because we can't yet provide a physical description of the very early universe, this has been fertile ground for speculations. This early region has been compared by some scientists to the regions on ancient maps labeled here there be dragons. Uh, it can be just filled with all sorts of fantasies. But the bord guth vilenkin theorem is independent of any physical description of that early beginning of the universe. Their theorem implies that even if the universe is just part of a wider multiverse of many universes, even then the multiverse itself must have an absolute beginning. Vilenkin is blunt about the implications. I quote, it is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. One can detect a boundary to space-time by either showing the re requirement for a singularity, that is to say a requirement for everything in the past to converge at a single point prior to which there couldn't have been a physical event, or you can prove it by what we're going to call the BVG theorem, which is a slightly different approach, but comes up with the same boundary to past time. I just want you to recognize three big space-time geometry arguments. The first one was put together by uh, Borda and Villenkin, Arvind Borda and Alexander Villenkin in 1993. In that particular argument, which by the way is still valid today, there is an exception for weak energy conditions, but even Alan Guth said, you know, he's, Alan Guth said, look, the weak energy condition problem is so minimally, minimally probable that I do not consider it a problem. They basically elucidated five conditions in an inflationary model universe, which our universe is, and showed that that inflationary model universe would have to have a singularity. In 1997, they discovered a minimally, 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 minimally probable possibility of weak energy conditions being violated, but it didn't seem like it could apply to any universe even remotely resembling our own. That's still very valid today. I mean, you know, even with the, the possible exception of the weak energy condition. The second came in 1999. Alan Guth, who is the father of inflationary theory, big MIT professor, uh, he actually uh, showed after a comprehensive study, goes through, right, assesses every single model. He comes out with this quote at the end. Hard as physicists have tried, to find some kind of an inflationary model universe that does not have a beginning. Still, he says, the universe uh, right now, every single cosmological model we have built based on an inflationary hypothesis has to have a beginning. He says it's so omnipresent that he considers it a virtual requirement of the inflationary model. But then the cap comes in 2003, when Borda, Villenkin, and Guth come up with what's called the BVG theorem, right? Borda, Villenkin, and Guth theorem. And that uh, theorem in uh, 2003 basically states that every inflationary model universe, all you have to have, you, doesn't matter what kind of universe it is, absolutely independent of the physics of the universe, right? Independent of the physics of the universe. Any inflationary model universe, so that's, or any expanding universe. In fact, it could be expanding at just a very minimal rate. Doesn't really matter. You just have to have an average Hubble expansion greater than zero. And what they predict is that's going to have to have a beginning too. 
And they did it in a very simple and elegant way. Essentially, you know, if you just analogize it, as Villenkin does, to, you know, a, a spaceship passing by Earth at 100,000 miles per hour. And, of course, the, 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 the galaxies are expanding away from us at 20,000 miles per hour because of the expansion of space, let's say. Okay? So, remember, space is expanding between the galaxies. So, of course, this, uh, this uh, space sh ship, by the time it, it gets to, uh, let's say, another galaxy out there, what the observers see is that the, universe is, uh, uh, that the spaceship is coming at them at 80,000 miles per hour, 100,000 minus 20,000. Well, if you keep that analogy, right, of the expanding universe and the slowing down, right, of, of uh, relative velocities within the universe itself, as you keep going backwards, if you see what I'm saying, through time, you're going to get then relative velocities which are increasing, right? You go to the future, decreases, you go back in time, it increases until you finally come to the speed of light in a finite proper time. And you're not going to exceed that with a relative velocity in any universe remotely resembling our own. Now, what he says is that's a boundary to space-time. And that boundary to space-time, it could be a mark, on a pathway to another uh, kind of physics, or it could be an absolute beginning of the universe itself. But, and here's the curious thing, let's suppose it's a pathway to another kind of physics. Then, of course, he says, but if that universe, with its different physics, all it has to meet is one condition, that's average Hubble expansion is greater than zero, then, of course, it, too, must have a boundary to space-time. And if that demarcated another one to another uh, uh, physics, and that physics had an average Hubble expansion greater than zero, that would have to have a beginning. And eventually, you get to the point where you're actually going to have to have a beginning of all the beginnings of all the speculated and hypothesized pre-universes you're going to have to have. One where finally uh, there is no mark of a physics, but it's just simply the beginning of the universe itself. Because the only condition that needs to be met is an average Hubble expansion greater than zero. People said, well, wait a minute, what about an oscillating universe or something of that nature? Even still, the BVG theorem applies because all you need is an average Hubble expansion. So just as long as the expansions and contractions average out to minimally greater than one, which they would have to if you started with an expansion, then, of course, you got a problem. Every known conceivable model of the universe has to have a beginning. There have been many people who've tried to make exceptions, right? Try to prove that the universe had, for example, uh, an average Hubble expansion equal to zero or less than zero. Every single one of those models fails for observational purposes. And by the way, some of them are just plain ludicrous. I mean, you've got things where you've got uh, you know, so much dark energy in the universe, much more than we have right now, and the superabundance of dark energy causes a big rip in space, and the big rip in space causes all the matter to fractionate, and our universe is just a single... This is all to get out of you know, the BVG theorem, but, of course, B, BKL chaos disproves it, so it doesn't matter anyway. So, but the, the point is, you know, it's, it's, this is the extremes that people really have to go to in order to disprove, uh, right now, the BVG theorem. My first argument was based on the origin of the universe. And I argued first that the universe began to exist. And he, here he says, well, but look, there are different multiverse scenarios, various models of the universe. I talked about those in my opening speech and explained that the bohr guth vilenkin theorem applies to those and shows the beginning of the universe. In 2003, Arvin Bohr, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to prove that any universe which is, on average, in a state of cosmic expansion throughout its history, cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. What makes their proof so powerful is that it holds regardless of the physical description of the very early universe. Because we don't yet have a quantum theory of gravity, we are not able to provide a physical description of the first split second of the early universe. 
But the borg guth vilenkin theorem is independent of any such physical description of that moment. Their theorem implies that the quantum vacuum state of the early universe, which some popularizers have misleadingly and inaccurately characterized as nothing, cannot be eternal in the past, but must have had an absolute beginning. Even if our universe is just a tiny part of a so-called multiverse composed of many universes, their theorem requires that the multiverse itself must have a beginning. Now, of course, highly speculative scenarios like loop quantum gravity models, string models, even closed time-like curves have been proposed to try to avoid this absolute beginning. However, these models are fraught with problems, and the bottom line is that none of these theories, even if true, succeed in restoring an eternal past. At most, they just push the beginning back a step. And then he says, but uh, Vilenkin says that you can avoid the uh, board booth vilenkin theorem by positing a contraction prior to this one. In response to the question, does your theorem prove that the universe must have had a beginning, Alex Vilenkin answers, no, but it proves that the expansion of the universe must have had a beginning. You can evade the theorem by postulating that the universe was contracting prior to some time. Now, this is a statement from a letter of Vilenkin to Victor Stenger, which is very often quoted out of context by atheists. Let me read you the full context. Vilenkin says, <clears throat> you can evade the theorem by postulating that the universe was contracting prior to some time. This sounds as if there is nothing wrong with having a contraction prior to expansion. But the problem is, that a contracting universe is highly unstable. Small perturbations would cause it to develop all sorts of messy singularities, so it would never make it to the expanding phase. So, he says, if someone asks me whether or not the theorem I proved with Bord and Guth implies that the universe had a beginning, I would say that the short answer is yes. If you are willing to get into subtleties, then the answer is no, but. That is to say, you've got the problem with the messy singularities that prevent re-expansion. So, in fact, the borg guth vilenkin theorem does imply an absolute beginning of the universe. Dr. Milligan says, but we need a quantum theory of gravity to describe the early universe. The borg guth vilenkin theorem is independent of that. Vilenkin says, the remarkable thing about this theorem is its sweeping generality. We did not even assume that gravity is described by Einstein's equations. So if Einstein's gravity requires some modification, our conclusion will still hold. So it, it isn't affected by having a quantum gravity uh, description. Here's Vilenkin's conclusion. It is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. So, okay, we want to find out about the beginning of the universe, how it began, and we have these three properties. We have the composition of the universe, we have the geometry of the universe, and we have the inhomogeneity, as well as the homogeneity of the universe, and understanding those three. Now, each of the three, the mechanisms to explain that, are they indeed consistent with at least this universe having a beginning? Uh, yeah, all three of these depend crucially on the idea that the universe started out incredibly small and has been expanding dramatically since then. And that's what results in the cooling, which allows these funny processes that create a net baryon number to happen in the early universe, but then clearly they turned off. 
you know, the present universe, the baryons just sit there yeah. uh, and are stable. Uh, and that's true of the other properties as well. So yeah, it certainly looks like uh, the universe that we observe around us, uh, the universe as we know it, definitely had a beginning. Uh, that doesn't mean that that beginning was necessarily the ultimate beginning of all of reality. There may have been some prehistory to what we're here calling the beginning, but the universe as we know it certainly began, we think, about 13.7 billion years ago. And the inflation theory, which explains some of those properties so, so wondrously, uh, would engender the possibility of there being other beginnings, but I think you and some others have shown that ultimately there had to be some uh, original, the mother of all beginnings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, that's right. Uh, those issues are still a little unclear. I wouldn't uh, say that those things are shown beyond doubt, uh, but with reasonable assumptions, one could show that even in the context of inflation, with many bubbles forming, um, there would still be somewhere an ultimate beginning.